Okay. Uh, questions? Raise thy hand. Uh, Sudhir. Uh, yeah, this is for Brian. Um, I was wondering if you could give a, like a really short like overview of, of your process in uh, uh, increasing uh, kelp forests. Thank you for the question. Uh, so how do we increase the kelp forests? We start with a uh, floating substrate, and that floating substrate is like a grid. What kelp needs to survive are holdfasts that are underneath the water and that provide a place for the roots to hang on and then a supply of nutrients. So those two are provided by our floating marine permaculture array. And um, initially, we'll grow those in places that have kelp naturally. Now, here off New England, we have sugar kelp. And there's interest in, in fact, having a sugar kelp array uh, deployed off New England that would enable this architecture. Alternatively, off California, it's a macrocystis giant Pacific kelp. And there, we would attach uh, the, the small uh, kelps there, and then uh, provide the wave-driven nutrient upwelling. So effectively, the upwelling provides the nutrients, and uh, the holdfasts are attached to the array itself. Um, uh, yeah, we we'll take, take a female person next. Oh, oh it's behind you, Brian. Oh. Young lady in the stretch. Right, right. My question's for Tom. So do you propose, is there any way to, mm, will, your, will your coral um, system be able to be self-sufficient in the future? Because, um, you know, right now, I guess, yeah, that's my only question. Do you think they could be self-sufficient once you make them um, strong enough to be on their own? Will they, con will they continuously need to have those electric currents in order to thrive? Or could this be used as like a, like a stronger, rehabilitation uh, process so that they can be on their own? Uh, are the, I, you better repeat the question. The question yeah. is, are the, the bio-rock reefs uh, going to become self-sufficient, or will they need the electrical input for uh, forever? Yeah. Well, the answer is that it's the electrical input that's giving them the extra energy to resist stress. So either you get rid of the stress, or you've got to keep giving them the energy. And that, that's the unfortunate situation that we're in. It is, um, what people ask me is, you know, when can you shut the power off? And my answer is when global warming and pollution go away. All right. And that, that's, I mean, that's not a nice answer to have to give. I wish we weren't, weren't having to keep these ecosystems on life support. But I don't see any way around it right now. Um, I mean, it's quite striking this year in Indonesia, for instance, those reefs that were under power all the time, we had almost no mortality on them. The ones who were getting no power, almost everything died. The ones who were only getting power in the daytime didn't do very well. I mean, it's, it's because it was hot at night and they weren't getting electricity at night. So um, unfortunately, I mean, we're, we're not going to remove the stresses as quickly as we need to. And that means we can only save what we can save. And that's only going to be in places where people have a direct stake in maintaining what's in front of them. Uh, the majority of it, I don't think there's very much we can do except to reduce the stresses and wait a long time. Tom, I have a question about the bio rock since we're on the subject. Uh, uh, there's an obvious question that we want large scale restoration projects and, and uh, obviously there's a difficulty in getting funding for things like that. Where there are uh, incentives for such funding, I, I think of urban harbors because in addition to the uh, biodiversity benefits, you could get I would think from large-scale bio-rock structures, you could get storm surge protection if it's done properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was glad to see you gave the New York Harbor example. Obviously, you're not going to grow coral in New York Harbor. No, no, but, but we, oysters, we oysters and, and sea grass. And yes. and yeah. I mean, the, the problem is what we do. I mean, that project in New York City, for instance, we've done for about eight or nine years with no funding. It's been paid out of pocket by one of my students. and. Um, the city is spending millions of dollars throwing dead oysters in the water and praying that new ones will settle on them, and it's not happening. Um, Jamaica Bay, which is the biggest salt marsh in New York City, is disappearing due to sea level rise. And they're, you know, they're, they've got people boasting they're going to propagate a million oysters and dump them there, and they're all going to die. So you know, they're not using what we know how to do at all. But they're worried about superstorms. What? 
But there's, there's a need to protect against superstars. Oh, there's superstars. a real need. But I mean, basically what people are doing is they're throwing away money on methods that we know don't work from past experience. And, it's really unfortunate. And, and this is the paradigm trap <laughs> that we're in. Um, Gina, and then... Uh, This, I really this is want to Brian's follow up, exercise regimen here. Follow up on that question. How much would some of your typical projects cost and how what are the specific barriers that you're finding when you try to get funding? Yeah, how much does a project cost? That's really hard to answer because a project can be any size or shape and there's so many site specific features. You know, you really have to understand the physics, the chemistry, the biology, the geology, the oceanography of the site to really design something. <coughs> so um, I mean, there, there are expenses. You've got to put in materials, steel, electrical cables, some sort of supply of power, and you've got to protect. And most important is you have to maintain them. You know, we've done hundreds of these projects all over the world, and every project has worked when we built them. Whether they continue to work depends on whether they're maintained. And in most cases, people aren't willing to maintain these projects, not unless they have a personal stake in it. Since we work with no money, since we don't get paid ourselves, we can't afford to pay anyone else. And so that, that's the, you know, the fundamental motivation most people have for maintaining it, because they're getting money at the end of the day. Well, OK, but, but actually, let, let, me, let me answer some, the question there on costs. Um, if you take a typical seawall, I mean, for instance, Sea level rise is going to be the biggest expense of global warming, and everyone has their head in the sand. They're all pretending it's not going to happen. Okay, where there is coastal protection, it's disaster response. It's after the seawall has fallen in, they give you some money to throw more rocks in the water after it. But there's, no one is anticipating what's going to happen. No one. There's no international agency in the world that takes responsibility for adapting to sea level rise. Not one. I mean, I've spent a lot of time going to UNDP and the World Bank. They, they assure me that somebody must be doing it, but it's certainly not them. Okay? And no one is. It's just they'll all drop the ball. Okay, now, if we have to build a seawall because our airports and roads and hotels are falling into the sea, that typically costs about 13 to $15 million a kilometer for a rock or concrete wall, almost anywhere. It, it, you know, if you've got a lot of rock nearby and you don't have to bulldoze it very far, it's a little cheaper, but that, that's a fairly typical cost. So you're talking about $15 million per kilometer. We can grow back the ecosystems for you know, one-fifth or one-tenth as much. The rock wall provides no ecosystem services at all. And what we do provides all sorts of things. So it really is a lot cheaper. Um, but there's a real cost, and I mean, I think what you have to compare that cost to is the cost of doing nothing at all. Um, the problem is we don't pay for the ecosystem services. We regard them as free goods, so we don't respect the mangroves. We chop them down. We don't care that it's giving us fish and food and fuel and honey and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it, it's when the point comes where we have to import fish because we have no fish to feed our people, when the beaches are all gone and there are no hotel jobs, uh, when, you know, when we have to build seawalls, otherwise our buildings are falling into the sea, that's when we'll appreciate what we've lost. Then it's going to cost a lot of money to make fake fakes that don't provide the same services. But um, we don't want to get to that point. I mean, restoring the natural ecosystems is cheaper and provides all these other benefits, and, and we've got to compare them against the cost of doing nothing at all, which is very intangible. <laughs> it's a hard, hard number to compare against. Just, it's big. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it's big, but I mean, the, the point is, you know, the, the cost of moving billions of people out of flooding lowlands is going to be vastly greater. You know, you, you look, almost all the big right, cities what, of the that, world are, are going to be underwater right. in, in another generation yeah, the or cost, two. The cost of doing nothing yeah, is very, yeah. very right. big. Brian? Uh, this question is for Tom again. It's a little technical. Um, uh, you provide electricity, but are your structures um, insulated so that the power doesn't like go right into the ground? No, or? no, no, they're not. They're not. Um, and is it AC or DC? It really and, and hasn't been voltage? that much of a problem, but I would say if, if the sediments are very electrically conductive, you're, you're probably dissipating energy. I mean, for instance, if you do a project in a place with a lot of old steel lying around, and it's a lot of places like that, you know, people bulldoze all sorts of garbage into the water. Um, that steel will kind of draw a bit of current. It'll act like a passive electrode. So, uh, you know, we've had places where we're losing power to those things. It's not, not really a big problem. 
And is it AC, DC, and what voltage? Oh, we're using low voltage direct current. We're using just a couple volts. A couple. It's completely safe. I mean, that, that's, you know, of course, I mean, they're all the Frankenstein jokes we hear all the time, you know, electroshock therapy, one, one thing or another. But, um, I mean, the way I look at it, I look at it as an electro tickle, not as an electrocution. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, actually, when you charge your corals, they smile back at you. I mean, it's quite amazing that I, I, if I take a project that the a cable has broken, for instance, has been off power for a long time, and I go back there and fix it, what, what you'll see is the corals actually lose their color. They become much more dull and pale in color. The larval fish disappear. I come and turn the power back on. Within a day, I can see the corals brighten up and smile at me. I can see the, the small fish sort of crowding around and, and migrating back. So it's, I mean, it's remarkable. In fact, when, when, I, when I do a new project, we can see the mineral growth beginning usually within hours or less. I can actually see the new coral growth of things I transplant within a day. I mean, I have, you have to look very closely to know what you're looking at, but I mean, it's, it's that quick a response. It just gets better all the time. So, yeah. What's amazing with some of these structures, we put them in, in places where there was no, essentially no corals and fish, and every time we go there, there's twice as much fish as there were before, new species and all of that. And one of the things we've done with it is, is that for two villages in Indonesia, one was the poorest village in Bali, and the other was about the poorest village in Lombok. These are subsistence fishing villages. Their reefs had died from global warming and, and dynamiting. They wiped out their resources, and they were, they were just didn't, didn't have food to eat. And these villages now, each of them has more than 100 bio-rock reef structures. They're booming economically. They're, they're jobs for everyone because they're, they're, they're tourists coming in from all over the world to see the corals and the fish. And it's just, just out of control. I mean, in fact, out of control development. Now we're beginning to see a serious pollution problem because, of course, they're not treating their sewage in, in these places. But, but I mean, the point is we've transformed very poor communities into, into pretty rich ones by, being, by restoring their environment. Now, the difficulty is that those, since we're working without funding, we're going to hotels and dive shops, and they're, they're you know, contributing for something in front of them. Most times, they don't even want to maintain them, so you know, those ones aren't going to work. But at any rate, we've done this with, with only locally generated funding. Okay? And that means, I mean, Indonesia is a country, you know, 80% of the protein comes from the sea. Indonesia is 250 million people. Okay? And there's only a handful of villages that have that kind of tourism that they, they can make money. You know, our projects are funded by tourists who donate 15 euros, and we grow their name in limestone out of wire. And you get a photograph of their coral at the end of the year because we have no funding. That, I mean, it's, it's a gimmick to have to do that. I'm ashamed that we have to do that sort of, sort of stuff. But we restored the fisheries of these villages. We built up fish populations where there weren't any. They were spilled over into the surrounding areas. And the fishermen say, you know, at first, they were opposed to that. They didn't want any area protected from fish. They wanted to catch the last fish while they had the chance before their neighbor did it. And now their view is, you know, we want these in every village. We want every other village in Indonesia to do what we did to restore their fishes. The problem is the other villages don't have tourism industry, so they can't tap local funding. And so unless it's, it becomes an international funding priority that the government says we, we have to restore habitat to restore fish, and we're going to make sure that the international donor community funds get targeted to that purpose, nothing much is going to happen. We have a question for Brian here. So Brian, this is about the biochar um, facility that you had uh, put together in Delhi. We're, we're not hearing you. Could you point the mic to your face? Hello? Better? Did somebody accidentally press the Yes, go ahead with the biochar question. So uh, in New Delhi, how well was it received? And has it been economically viable? Thank you for that question. The project in northern India has been very well received. We actually uh, got an article in the Times of India, uh, which is a circulation two and a half times that of the New York Times, and also on nationwide TV. Uh, so from that perspective, they're waiting with bated breath to actually see alternatives to rice straw burning. The challenge today is that rice straw burning is widely practiced because there's no economical alternative. The uh, it's actually illegal to burn rice straw, but the farmers have no practical alternative. What we want to do is build value chains and fill in the gaps in those value chains so we can turn what is today rice straw burning into biochar plus compost plus microbial communities that can effectively restore depleted soils. So we'll know in a year's time how we're doing when we actually uh, get tooled up and, and really encourage farmers to 
practice these alternatives, we're working with smart villages across Haryana to actually enable this over the next year. And this over the next uh, year will be developing the business models that create those value chains for the farmers. Right. Do you want to just mention the, the application to sewage? Yes, there, over the last four years, we've actually looked at the combination of taking uh, agricultural wastes, like the, um, the rice straw, and also using some of the process heat from that to effectively uh, sanitize septage. That's also quite a problem in India. So effectively, we're able to clean up rivers and streams by uh, providing good sanitation. And ultimately, once that sanitation is provided on a village scale, those nutrients, once sanitized, can go right back onto the fields in Class A biosolids. So we see a key synergism here, and the synergism is at the village level, at the town level, and at the city level to recycle. And this actually starts in the villages. Why? Because the carbon cost of transporting the waste uh, and, the, and the waste uh, fertilizer and all the rest is only a few kilometers. And I was told this morning that uh, it's by, I believe, Benoit, that it's only something like uh, five grams of carbon per kilometer to transport across the sea and perhaps also by truck. And so uh, you can do that carbon accounting and it ends up being a two or three percent effect. Whereas if you have to go into a major city uh, and you have to go 100 kilometers to get to the farm, it's much harder. So it starts in a distributed sense and it's probably best to start with the smaller villages and cities. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, you're all amazing people. I, I wish I could spend time questioning all of you. Uh, quick question for Brian again though. Um, the kelp, how far offshore can they grow and what variables would uh, affect them in terms of their growth, such as wind or current? And um, do you see them perhaps in the place where all that plastic is mucking about in the Pacific and things like that? Thank you for the question. Normally, kelp grows at a depth of 20 feet to 85 feet. And I think the opportunity, as we see it, is to build these floating platforms. Now, they're disposed at a depth of 25 meters for several reasons. First of all, they're resilient to shipping. We're designing these systems to, so that you can have an aircraft carrier run right over the top of them or a container ship run right over the top of these. They may mow down some kelp with their propeller, but they're not going to affect the marine permaculture, and the marine permaculture will not damage the vessels either. The key th point here is that right now, kelp forest ecosystems live in a tiny little ribbon on the west coast of the United States and even in New England with the sugar kelp at these ra depth ranges. By building a marine permaculture array, we can literally look at developing a, a kelp forest circle. That circle could be, or disk could be a kilometer in diameter, and it could go offshore in depths of 500 meters to 5,000 meters. So the point is the very middle of the ocean, even where you have these plastic systems. As much as we worry about plastic, I worry about the forage fish of the op ocean even more, because that's what people eat. You know, that's what the entire base of the fisheries of the ocean are, are based on. And so I see as our, our opportunity and our challenge is to make that work. It should work just fine in those mid gyre regions that have some plastic in them. It should also work very well in other parts of the ocean, particularly the subtropics where we've seen a ma marked decrease in overturning circulation. And by restoring that overturning circulation, by bringing back life to those parts of the ocean, we see the kelp forest as providing that habitat and that food that's so essential to keep life alive. Fred, then David. Yeah, I uh, have a question for Jim. Um, in your advertising in the booklet for your talk, uh, you, uh, you refer to increasing surface area and engineering an ice age, and I was hoping that you could summarize in two minutes what you might have spent half an hour or longer on. I, I would just say to that, uh, I'm, I'm going to be around at 3, three o'clock, and we can talk about that later. I, I don't really want to talk about it now because we've got these other amazing people here. So okay. thank you. So you, you'll do, Jim will do a workshop I'll, at 3 I'll o'clock. I'll do some stuff at 3 o'clock, and we'll go wherever you want to go. So. Um, one of the questions uh, well, I was thinking about y yesterday's professor at UMass uh, talking about oysters and how we want to rebuild those beds all along New England and everywhere else. And she's not here today, and yet today we learned we can use electricity to make the oysters grow faster. And um, in all of your talks, it seems like there's a funding problem, par particularly because uh, we're working in poor countries where they can't fund it. But it seems like in America, where we're rich, we can certainly get these oysters 
funded because we have electricity. And so, Tom, why aren't you connecting with the UMass professor and revitalizing the oyster beds all across New England? Yeah, Tom, why aren't you doing that? <laughs> Tom's, Tom's pretty busy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the answer is most people don't believe us unless they see it themselves. And so, I mean, we're. we're you know, publish some, a bunch of scientific papers, some books. We'll put out stuff in, in you know, wetland restoration conferences. And we kind of get people to be interested. I mean, for instance, in, in, uh, I mean, I was interested to hear what our colleague from Maine is saying because, you know, they're thinking ahead proactively and, and thinking what they have to do. And on the West Coast, there's a, I just a couple of days ago read through the West Coast Acidification Scientific Panel um, comments. And, you know, they're, they're not really trying anything. They're just trying to measure pH of the water and, and, and shutting down operations whenever it gets acidic. I mean, that, that's hardly prevention, you know. And, uh, I mean, what, what, what here we heard talking about is really trying to control the nutrients, so the pH, the CO2, growing back ecosystems that regulate the water quality. That, that, and, and, of course, stop, stopping the harm coming from land. I mean, that, that's going to be the way to go. But at the moment, what we're getting is the money... I mean, let me give an example. There's millions of dollars being spent on oyster restoration in the U.S. And it's being spent not in the name of mariculture because the waters are so polluted you can't eat these oysters in a lot of these places. Okay, right? My, my, my road right here in Cambridge okay, used to have a sign saying, Pleasant Street, to the Oyster Bank, 1632. Right down my road here in Cambridge was a huge oyster bank that fed all the city of Boston. It doesn't exist anymore. Okay, but what, what people are doing is they're bulldozing dead oyster sh shells and beds into the water and hoping things will settle on them, and they're not because of bad water quality. Now, in Chesapeake Bay, see, the oysters used to filter all the water in Chesapeake Bay about every three days or so, and that removed the, the particulate matter. That meant the water was clear. That meant light reached the bottom. That meant algae could grow on the bottom, and the algae were the food for the blue crabs that were their main, their main uh, you know, Product. Okay. Now, now, when they kill the oysters, now it takes three months for the water exchange. So the water is muddy. The crabs and the algae have all died. And you know, and what they're trying is doing is with millions of dollars is having almost no success at all. But I'm wondering, can't you just use the electricity to jumpstart them in bad Well, I, water I don't know. What, what, I mean, people are doing what they know how to do, and that's all they know how to do is and, and the same that they've done before, and they hope for a different result. And that's that's what we're sort of locked into. This, this, again, and it will keep coming up, and it <laughs> sneaks up on us all the time because we're not used to dealing and thinking in terms of paradigm shifts. You know. So it's not a question of what you do. It's a question of what you think. And mm. changing what people think, this is a very, and that's what was so impressive to me about Alfredo's presentation because he's working on so many angles of changing how people think. And that's what we're trying to do at Biodiversity for a Livable Climate and trying to encourage all of you to work on. I've been, I've been talking about this paradigm stuff for, I don't know, 15 years. And I still get caught up short because it's not part of the dominant culture. We don't think we're a paradigm that can be shifted. We think we're it. So until we get out of the we're it to oh, this can change, it's not about shifting the, the, just a little step. The, 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 thing that gives me hope, the thing that gives me hope is that a lot of these folks are working with local people that are invested in the system. I get really shook up when people start talking about money, you know, because we haven't figured out what to do about money in any of our systems, you know. But, uh, but you know, maybe, maybe we can figure it out. But the biggest thing about what this weekend was about for me was to get people up here that can look at nature and see what nature is trying to teach humans about living on this planet. The information flow is not ecological design so that you're making the stuff do what we want it to do. It's how do we help nourish that so that it can come back on its own. It already knows what to do. You know, and, and like Tom's systems are on life support, but we want to keep these systems alive, you know. Um, you know, mangroves, it's, it's maybe even more hopeful. And, uh, but how do we learn how to listen to nature and hear what it's telling us? And that's, you know, that's, that's what John Todd taught me. And uh, so I, I don't know, that's just my t two minutes. So. Okay, I, I would, um, Mick, I would like to, um, I don't mean to pounce on you, but, uh, but you're a politician, so you don't mind being pounced on, right? 
Um, no, I don't. And I think I have an answer but, but, to this question. But let me. But let me do my pounce. Sure. Then you can. Then you can do his pounce. Yeah. His unintentional pounce. Um, had you heard of BioRock before? And do you see any potential in terms of what you're doing? Um, I had not heard of BioRock previously. I am someone that works in the scientific community. We have, at the lab I work at, we have a couple of people that are working on corals. You're probably, most people might not be aware of this, but um, the Gulf of Maine houses a wide variety of uh, corals. They're, um, they're, they're not reef building corals, but they're solitary individuals. Um, I, I would be very interested to learn more ab about this system. C certainly it sounds like it has tremendous potential and it may have tremendous potential to work in Maine where we have a large number of calcareous shelled organisms um, that are struggling presently. So one of the reasons we structure these conferences and ask speakers to say stay for as long as they can is because one of our purposes is to get everybody talking to everybody else. And I think a lot of, a lot of scientists, um, you know, some of the best scientists, there's only so much you can do in a day, and you're off in, inevitably, there are walls, and we want to break those walls down. And I will say about Tom, whom I've known for about three years now, I mean, he's got a list of publications uh, that goes several pages long, um, and his accomplishments should, I'm sure, are obvious at, at this point. And he can't break through the paradigm. And he has, correct me if I'm stating it wrong, but he has virtually left academia as, as a fruitless exercise if you want to get anything done. Did I, stay, did I say that okay? Yeah, well, actually, let me, let me respond a little bit. I mean, you know, <laughs> to, to, to that. I mean, you know, I, I happen to live in what I call the demilitarized zone, halfway between MIT and Harvard. Um, is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. I happen to live in the, in the neutral zone, you know, halfway between MIT and Harvard. I have degrees from both places, you know, but I have no one to talk to at either university because there's no one at either university who has any interest in corals. Um, Neither university has ever had an expert on soils of any form, ever in their history. Neither university has ever had anyone doing environmental restoration or ecosystem restoration, ever in their history. And they don't think they need to. I mean, they think the money is there in developing all these gee whiz technologies that are what are destroying our planet because of the imbalances they produce. And, and, but the thing is, universities essentially have become money-making operations, what, they, what research they get into is dependent on the overhead they get. They know there's no money in coral research, they know there's no money in environmental restoration, they don't, they're not interested in academic programs in those fields, because if they produce students with degrees in them, they're not going to get jobs. They're not going to get overhead money. So, you know, there, there's, there's no potential for working with the academic institutions as long as they are essentially money-making operations rather than institutions that are designed to preserve old knowledge, understand the problems of the present, and prepare for the future, which is what, you know, it seems to me the goal of the university should be. We've lost that a long time ago. Uh, but, I mean, having said that, I mean, you know, they, they, there's, it's, it's true we need paradigm shifts. It's very difficult because uh, our educational system is so mal malfunctional. I mean, we don't learn how our natural word works and how to maintain it. That should be the first thing we learn in primary school. But if you learn that at all, you've got to learn it on your own, because no, no school will teach you that stuff. Um, and that's really unfortunate. And that, that's why our politicians, the political leaders, the ones who make the decisions of where the money goes, are so incredibly backward. They don't understand any of this stuff. With the exception of present company, of course. <laughs> Mick, did you want to say <laughs> something? I, I Most of the politicians. I think it's time to move on. OK. I think so. So, um, <laughs> so I it's, Um, everybody's asking me and asking all these people, um, why don't you get yourself funded? I am up to the max in time. And all these people out here who need to do something can get themselves educated and start getting the money for us. That's what we need. <laughs> all right. So uh, let's uh, make it back here by 2.30. We have two workshop well, are people okay with going out for a half-hour lunch? No. No. 
So can, can, can we get out there and back within a half hour? No. It would be very difficult. All right. It would be very difficult. Uh, okay. All right. 215 means we'll get started at 2.30. So we'll, we'll have it. Um, 215 slot. Uh, I mean, let's get back here at 215. <laughs> and... Uh,